The 2024 Formula 1 season has been one of the most baffling in recent memory as the pecking order for which cars are the fastest seems to change at every single Grand Prix weekend. At the start of the year, Red Bull Racing led the way with Max Verstappen in charge, while his teammate Sergio Perez put up a decent performance as a wingman for the first five racers, but from there on it's been pretty obvious that the McLaren machines driven by Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri are the best on the track. Despite this, the dynamic young duo have won just three of the last 11 events since their car asserted an upper hand on the rest of the field, with several outside contenders such as Lewis Hamilton and George Russell benefiting from a variety of strategical mishaps and incidents that weren't necessarily the fault of the papaya pair. From my rough calculations, the championship runner-up at the moment, Norris, has lost 43 points due to factors mostly outside of his control. Note that this doesn't include instances where he lost out due to his teammates failing to seed position, so this figure could extend further if you wanted it to. Even if a British driver does eventually usurp Verstappen, who seems to be in the fourth fastest car of this stage in the year, it will most certainly be one of the worst title campaigns in history, along with Mika Hakkinen's error prone 1999 year, where he only just beat Eddie Irvine, who himself severely underperformed, and Phil Hill's 1961 success that was guaranteed by the tragic death of his teammate Wolfgang von Trips in the penultimate round of the season. If the reigning three-time champion takes his fourth crown though, it will provide a rare instance where the fastest machine doesn't take home all the glory. One big criticism of Formula 1 levelled at it from other motorsports and other sporting competitions generally, such as football and basketball, is that the best car, not the most deserving driver, wins the trophy at the end of the year. While it is often the case that the fastest vehicle leads the way, it's not always a mutually exclusive situation where it can't be the best driver taking charge of the most dominant car. The prolific stretches of Schumacher, Vettel and Verstappen winning three, four and even five championships successively with relative ease may seem to prove the point of naysayers towards the most popular form of auto racing in the world, but many seasons disprove the theory that it's the engineers designing the machines that make all the difference. Throughout the first decade of Formula 1 though, it's difficult to find examples where a dominant car didn't take the title. The Alfa Romeo 158, driven by Giuseppe Farina and Juan Manuel Fangio in the inaugural two seasons of the competition, were a level above the rest, and this gulf was even more prevalent when the regulations were changed in the wake of the withdrawal of the Italian manufacturer at the end of the 1951 season to incorporate smaller and less powerful designs, a switch planned to give smaller constructors a chance to compete against the might of Ferrari. This attempt to draw the lesser teams level with the works outfits was unsuccessful as the 1952 and 53 titles for Alberto Ascari driving for the Prancing Horse were arguably the most dominant campaigns in history as the two-time champion won nine races in a row if you remove the Indianapolis 500 that wasn't held to F1 specifications. 1954 through to 57 saw Fangio assert his personal dominance over the rest of the field, switching from Maserati to the works Mercedes team midway through the 1954 campaign and taking another triumph with the Daimler operation of the year following. Despite his ambivalence towards Enzo Ferrari and his way of running a race team, he knew that the Scarlet D50 design that they had bought from Lancia would be a class above the rest, so he drove to his third consecutive crown as a result, then made a third switch in as many seasons to the Scuderia's rivals, returning to Maserati to take his fifth and final triumph. Fangio's semi-retirement after securing his legacy as arguably the greatest of all time saw 1958 act as a transitional year. This was the first instance where the team that propelled their driver to a personal success didn't also take the Constructors' Championship, as Mike Hawthorne oversaw Ferrari's return to the top, while the consistency of the van walls driven by Sterling Moss and Tony Brooks allowed the British outfit to take glory for their team at season's end. Arguably, this shouldn't have been one of the rare cases where the highest scoring constructor failed to deliver for individual drivers, as it was only Moss's gentlemanly conduct where he had Hawthorne's disqualification from the Portuguese Grand Prix rescinded due to him feeling that the result was unfair and he wanted to race on equal terms. Furthermore, the discrepancy between the British Van War machines and the Ferrari seemed negligible, as they were both fairly equal on the pole position front, although in race trim the green cars took six victories to the Italian outfits two. The emergence of Cooper and BRM, then Lotus and Brabham, defined the sport as it progressed into the 1960s, as Jack Brabham won the 1959 and 60 championships with some relative ease, while Ferrari had a resurgence in 1961, dominating with the aforementioned Phil Hill and the unfortunate Von Tripps. 
Graham Hill took BRM's only ever drivers and constructors success the year after that. Then came the emergence of Jim Clark and his perfect 1963 and 65 campaigns, having a 100% points tally for both years, sandwiching John Surtees' success with Ferrari as he became the only driver in history to win world titles on both two and four wheels, having won seven motorcycle racing championships before his stint in F1. Jack Brabham's eponymous team asserted its dominance in 1966 and 67, with the 40-year-old Aussie driver himself taking glory in the former year and his teammate Denny Horm doing so in the latter. Graham Hill rallied the Lotus team around him to success in 1968, following the death of Colin Chapman's protégé and great friend, the two-time champion Clark, while Jackie Stewart won driving Matra chassis for Ken Tyrrell the year after. This was the only time a privateer entry won a Formula 1 championship, and it was also the only instance where a car built outside of the United Kingdom or Italy was triumphant in the final standings. The decade of the 1960s was one of innovation, with groundbreaking discoveries such as monocoque chassis, aerofoil wings, and the emergence of the Ford Cosworth DFV engine, making sure that whoever mastered the new technology was far enough ahead of the competition to guarantee both titles in a dominant season, as there were no examples in the 11 years encompassing the era where the drivers' champions didn't drive for the team that won the constructors' title. This doesn't exactly dispel the idea that it's the best car and not the best driver that wins the Formula 1 championship every year, as in the first 20 years of the sport, only once did the outfit that was the quote-unquote fastest constructor not win the driver's crown too, and even then, it was obvious that the two machines weren't exactly far apart on the performance front. The early years of F1 were definitely about technical innovation, as were the seasons in the pre-war era, as events dating back to the first ever road race from Paris to Bordeaux in 1894 were all about which cars were the most efficient, fast and reliable, with no real focus on the driver. Obviously there were notable exceptions, like the legends of Tazio Nuvillari, Richard Seaman and Rudolf Caracciola towards the end of the 1930s, but this would change as the newer Formula 1 series evolved through to the 1970s. The development in aerodynamics persisted throughout the decade, as the Lotus and Tyrrell teams dominated the early part of this stretch. Jochen Rindt had amassed such a lead in the 1970 championship, driving the revolutionary 49C designed by Colin Chapman, that even his death in practice for Monza, with four races remaining, wasn't enough to take him off the top spot. 1971 was the year of Jackie Stewart and Tyrrell, who were now a constructor in their own right, while Lotus bought out another pioneering machine the year after, with side-mounted radiators and a proper airbox, and normally proportioned front and rear wings all appearing on F1 cars for the first time ever. Emerson Fittipaldi won the title, and the car remained competitive throughout 1973 in the hands of the reigning champion and his young teammate Ronnie Peterson, but its poor reliability record against Stewart's machine allowed the Scots to claim his third championship crown. Despite the combined effort of the Tyrrell outfit though, they couldn't defeat Lotus in the constructors' standings, as Francois Sever was unable to counteract the advances of a more well-round pairing in the golden JPS colours before his untimely passing at Watkins Glen. This was only the second instance where the car that had won the constructors title failed to lead the drivers champion to their success, and it sparks a bit of debate in terms of technicalities. The Lotus was clearly the faster of the two at the front, on raw pace, as it took two thirds of the available pole positions, with nine coming from Peterson and one from Fittipaldi, while the Swede also had four wins to his Brazilian counterparts three. Meanwhile, Tyrrell only started from the first grid spot twice, both with Stewart, and he also took all five of their race victories. Now it's arguable that Sever may not have been on the same level of performance as the Lotus drivers, but nonetheless, I think this proves that the Lotus was indeed the fastest car in 1973. What it lacked though, was reliability. Stewart only suffered one mechanically induced retirement all year compared to two for Fittipaldi and five for Peterson, which raises an important point. The fastest car in a given season might not always be the best, especially in the first 70 years or so in F1. There's no use to getting pole positions and leading laps if you can't finish the races. Thus, counting in the reliability of both the Tyrrell and the JPS Lotus machines, I'd argue their balance of speed and efficiency even out to a point where differences in performance are negligible. Even if you take one of Fittipaldi's retirements to make him level with Stewart on that front and turn it into a win, he still comes up 7 points short of the title, although if the same criteria was applied to his Swedish teammates, I think he may have ended up on top instead. Thus, I believe that the Tyrrell and Lotus in 1973 were both equally the best cars, even if not equal in terms of pure pace. Thus we can say that in this year, a machine that was at least joint best won at the end of the season.
1974 saw Fittipaldi win his second championship, this time with McLaren, although a late season resurgence from Ferrari's Clay Regazzoni and Niki Lauda nearly scuppered their chances. The Austrian got his way the year following, winning with ease, then came 1976. This season is the most famous in F1 history, and everyone is familiar with the epic battle between Lauda and James Hunt that eventually saw the Brit end up victorious. If you aren't up to speed with this year, firstly, what on earth are you doing with your life? Secondly, watch Rush. It's a great documentary style film, even if it made it seem like the two title protagonists hated each other when that wasn't the case. Despite Hunt's triumph, Lauda and his teammate Regazzoni had the upper hand in the Constructors' Championship. Deciphering the performance of a McLaren M23 and the Ferrari 312T and T2 is a difficult task for two reasons. The first one is obviously that Lauda missed two races recovering from his fiery accident at the Nürburgring, and without that crash, he would have easily taken his second crown, and also you have to take into account the calibre of the drivers in each car. I'd argue that Hunt and Regazzoni were on fairly equal footing in terms of output, as where the Brit excelled in raw speed, he lacked the consistency of his more experienced counterpart. However, it's the other McLaren driver, Jochen Mass, that let his team down. The German got less than a third of his teammates' points and finished ninth in the championship. I think, to be honest, the Ferrari was probably stronger in the early portion of the year, but McLaren gained, especially while Lauda was away, which may have disguised their true form. So just like 1958 and 1973, I'd argue that the two title protagonist cars were negligibly equal in terms of performance throughout the season. 1977 was a cakewalk for Lauda, while the year after saw the re-emergence of a revolutionary Chapman and Lotus combination, as Mario Andretti powered to the black and gold team's last title. Ferrari succeeded with Jody Schechter and Gilles Villeneuve fairly comfortably in 79, although there were various challenges from Ligier and towards the end of the season, Williams. The Grove outfit took triumph with Alan Jones without much opposition as the 1980s began, then the season after this triggered an unusual stretch. The three years from 1981 to 83 saw a trio of consecutive instances where the Constructors' Champions did not win the driver's title as well. Nelson Piquet won the crown for Brabham in 81, but the Williams duo of Carlos Reutemann and the defending Jones were only one and four points away from the Brazilian respectively. It was a similar situation for 1976 though, as the teammate of the driver's champion put up an inadequate performance. Ironically, the man who had suffered at the hands of a lacklustre counterpart, James Hunt, often lambasted the second Brabham driver, Hector Aback, in commentary for the BBC for his inability to perform, as the Mexican only had 11 points and a best result of fourth, while his teammate had 50 on his tally and three race victories. Well, it's a sad thing, Mario. I mean, with the greatest respect, Rabak is not a world-class driver, and uh, he's in an infinitely superior car to Carlos Reutemann, which... Uh, it just makes a mockery of Grand Prix racing, and I'm afraid it's, it's the current rules and all the arguments uh, in that uh, having argued for six months or more over the rules and practically broken the sport, they then come up with a set of rules which is a load of complete rubbish. Weirdly though, only six of the 15 pole positions available were scored by either Brabham or Williams during 1981. Aside from the one-off first place starts for Ricardo Patrese's Arrows, Gilles Villeneuve's Ferrari and Jacques Lafitte's Ligier, the remaining sextet of opportunities were taken by the French duo of René Arnoux and Alain Prost driving for Renault. This was around the point where turbocharged engines came to prevalence in Formula 1, and they'd certainly had a massive advantage in qualifying. The troublesome power units often failed to finish races though, meaning that while the Renault was definitely the fastest car of 1981, it definitely wasn't the best due to its poor reliability. I think that given PK scored four poles to William's total tally of one, and won the same amount of races that the pair of Grove drivers did, as well as having better reliability, meant that although the Brabham team didn't take the Constructors' title thanks to Rebac's incompetence, they definitely had the fastest car, even if it was only by a small margin, thus meaning the best car won the 1981 Drivers' Championship. The next year would be an even stranger tale. I've already covered the 1982 season in a separate video if you'd like to check it out in the top right corner of your screen after you've watched this one, because it was truly crazy. Renault took two thirds of the pole positions on offer, but also retired from 21 of their 32 starts that year, meaning that again, despite having the fastest car, this time by a considerable margin, it was nowhere near the best. In terms of a Constructors' Championship, Ferrari led McLaren, and behind the unreliable Renault was Williams, a team that was being led by the inexperienced Keke Rosberg. 
The Scuderia may have accrued the most points as a combined package, but the loss of Gilles Villeneuve after his fatal accident and Didier Peroni after his career-ending crash at Hockenheim stopped both drivers' hopes for success, with Peroni claiming the runners-up position in the standings. McLaren's John Watson showed consistency, rarely matched by anyone else, while Nicky Lauda showed decent results on his return to F1. Despite being the only naturally aspirated team to win four races, they lacked the killer instinct to take the driver's crown, even though Watson got close, levelling Peroni's points tally on 39. While Renault had an appalling reliability record, Prost still finished within a race win's distance from the eventual champion, while the fourth-placed Williams led Keke Rosberg to his only championship crown. This is the lowest constructors finish for a car that became champion, and it's particularly surprising given the fact that it wasn't even the fastest naturally aspirated machine on the grid. The pecking order in terms of raw pace clearly saw Renault lead Ferrari, Brabham and McLaren, with Williams probably fifth, but removing the turbo cars, it was still behind the Woking team, even if they didn't have great second drivers, in the form of a retiring Carlos Reutemann, a mediocre Derek Daly, and a one-off performance from Mario Andretti. Rosberg still had better consistency than Watson though, and clutched up in the second half of the year while the Ulsterman ended a points drought, meaning that this was the first instance where a driver's champion didn't have at least the joint best car. In fact, I'd argue that obviously ignoring the unreliable Renaults and Brabhams, the Williams laid third in the pecking order behind Ferrari and McLaren. It took for a crazy season where 11 drivers and 7 teams won races to find an example of the best car not being the eventual winner, but finally we've found one. 1983 was the third consecutive instance where the Drivers' Champions team didn't win the Constructors' Championship, but this was due to more shenanigans from Brabham. Ricardo Patrese, who had replaced Rabak the year prior, was definitely a step up in quality for the team, but he suffered the brunt of a retirement in 1983, failing to reach the chequered flag in 11 events compared to PK's four. He finished 9th in the standings with nearly a fifth of his teammates' tally, meaning Brabham had lost out to both Ferrari and Renault in the Constructors. The French outfit actually suffered less retirements than the Scuderia and got the same number of wins, but lacked the consistency to be the best team. It also didn't help that while Prost finished merely two points away from PK, his teammate Eddie Cheever got outscored 57 to 22. I think that given the Americans' poor performance, the Renault was clearly a better car in race trim than the Ferrari, even if not in qualifying, while the Brabham was probably third quickest on raw pace and second on Sundays, meaning that again, the best car didn't win the title for the second year running. Unfortunately, 1984 was a McLaren fest, and while Ayrton Senna showed promise in qualifying and Nicky Lauda had atrocious reliability, the Woking outfit still prevailed in both championships in 1985. The year after was different, however. The Williams duo of PK and Nigel Mansell constantly took points off each other while Prost stayed within arm's reach until the Grove pair capitulated in the final round in Adelaide, with the Brit famously getting a colossal tyre blowout at high speed, while his Brazilian counterpart pitted again to avoid the same fate. It's hard to tell which car was faster, as Prost's teammate Rosberg had too many retirements to really gauge his performances, even if he did show good pace in places like Adelaide, and in qualifying the two top teams only took five pole positions due to the emergence of Senna at Lotus and the Benetton of Teo Fabi. I think the Williams probably just edged the McLaren in terms of competitiveness, as even when he finished, Rosberg rarely did so very highly, while both PK and Mansell were always up there. Thus, for the third time in five years, the best car failed to win the championship. Williams dominated in 1987, then McLaren did so in 88 and 89 with Senna and Prost, then in 1990 the Brazilian won again by a close shave to his rival who had moved to Ferrari, although given Nigel Mansell's underperformance at the Scuderia, it's hard to know whether the Woking outfit was actually faster. The Grove team in blue then re-emerged towards the back end of 1991, although they were unable to usurp Senna, but they did manage to do so by a dominant margin in the following two seasons. The 1994 and 95 campaigns, though, were strange ones, as in both seasons, the Williams was clearly the fastest car, especially towards the back end of the former year. Despite this, the harder to drive and overall slower Benetton of Michael Schumacher took both championships. I've already detailed in a separate video why Damon Hill underperformed through this entire stint of his career, but essentially, I believe that this is the closest example of a comparison we can make to 2024. 1994 was less so, as following Senna's death, Schumacher continued his early season domination, but was in mine and many other people's opinions, unfairly reined in by his disqualifications and suspensions for four races in the middle part of the year. He won the championship despite missing a quarter of a season, and Benetton also lost the Constructors' title. 
Admittedly, this may have been partly because Shuey's teammates were utterly hopeless for the most part, but this also ties into the fact that just like the modern Red Bull, only the exceptionally talented first driver could make the car go fast. I believe that especially following the B-Spec upgrades to Hill's car at Monaco, that machine was the class of the field, highlighted by a rookie David Coulthard and a 41-year-old Nigel Mansell running right at the front on numerous occasions. You might argue that Hill lost the championship at Adelaide, but I also believe that he shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. When your rival is missing for 25% of the season, you need to take advantage of that, and assert a lead like James Hunt did, not just pull level. It was a similar story for 1995, as although the Benetton was more refined, Johnny Herbert was nowhere near Michael, and was lucky to inherit two wins when Hill decided he didn't know what brakes were. Damon's team got three quarters of the pole positions, and was clearly the fastest car, yet he retired three times due to his own mistakes, losing out in the process. 1994 and 95 were the fourth and fifth examples of when the best vehicle failed to win a driver's championship, and arguably the first instance so far in history where it was down to the existence of inadequate drivers being able to perform in top machinery. Sound familiar? 1996 and 97 saw Williams establish dominance over the chasing pack as Schumacher moved to rejuvenate Ferrari, and while he and Mika Hakkinen battled in 1998, the Finn came out on top in what was admittedly the better of the two cars. 1999 was less concrete though, as Hakkinen had the worst title campaign in recent memory, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. He crashed out several times, which allowed Eddie Irvine to keep in touch, as he shifted his focus to being the number one at Ferrari, following his teammate's leg break at Silverstone. Despite this, I believe that given the gap in performance between Schumacher and Prime Hakkinen is far smaller than the gulf between Mika and Eddie, I think the Scuderia put together the best car in 1999, hinted by their better constructors position, despite having a poor second half of the year, for the new second driver Mika Salo, who struggled on all but a handful of tracks. I believe this is another example where the best car failed to win a championship, and we would have seen this if Schumacher did the full year. The opening five seasons of the new millennium, though, established the Germans' authority, as apart from patches in 2001 and late 2003, it was obvious the Scarlet cars were on top from the beginning of the decade to the end of 2004. Renault were the most complete package the year after that, as although McLaren were certainly faster over one lap, their cars would spontaneously combust at any given moment. 2006 saw a resurgent Scuderia come to fruition and challenge the French champions, and the gap was only five points in the constructors, in Renault's favour. Given the fact that Prime Alonso and a slightly past his peak Schumacher were fairly equal in terms of performance, and the second drivers Massa and Fisichella shared the same traits of inconsistency, I believe these two cars were equal across the year. 2007 saw McLaren bottle the title in what was the fastest car, as Alonso and Lewis Hamilton took points off each other in their own little civil war, and although the Woking outfit didn't win the constructors due to the Spygate scandal, I think we can add this to the list of non-best cars winning the drivers' championship. 2008 saw a repeat of two years earlier in my opinion, as although Massa was inconsistent, he was also fast on his day, while although Lewis had high peaks like Silverstone, he wasn't always performing at his best. Heike Kovalainen's underperformance gave Ferrari the team's trophy, but I believe these cars were fairly equal. 2009 resembles the story of this current season pretty well actually, as it shows the team falling off midway through the year and the previously second placed outfit coming into fruition. Ironically, Red Bull were in the opposite position 15 years ago to what they are now, but Braun GP held on for a historic title at the first time of asking. The beginning of a new decade saw a new concept of drivers from three teams contending for the crown, as the Milton Keynes Energy Drink Company was best on high downforce tracks, while McLaren were prevalent on the more straight-line focused circuits, and Ferrari were a mix of both. While RB and the Woking outfits both had competent second drivers helping them back up their leading counterparts, with both Mark Webber and Jensen Button arguably being equally good, or even potentially better, candidates for success than the teammates who eventually came in front, the Scuderia struggled as Felipe Massa failed to match his pre-Hungary 2009 form. Sebastian Vettel won the driver's title, and his team took the constructors in what was marginally the best car overall. Then he dominated 2011 and 2013, two seasons which sandwiched a close shave in 2012, which nearly saw a royal upset from Fernando Alonso in a car that went from fifth quickest at the first event of the year in Melbourne to the second place car towards the conclusion of the year. 2014 saw the introduction of turbo hybrid engines and the beginning of the Mercedes dominance, as they were untouched until 2016. Ferrari nearly upset the German outfit's rhythm in the following two years, but late season drop-offs cemented their rival stronghold on the competition, ahead of 2019 and the campaign affected by the disease that may not be named just after.
In 2021, despite losing the championship on the last lap, or in one of the other instances where Hamilton made an error, if you have common sense, Mercedes still won the constructors. The fact that the two leading drivers were level on points after 21 rounds points to the idea that although performance fluctuated between the two at various points, holistically they were most likely negligibly equal across the season, meaning it's another joint equal situation. 2022 and 23 were Verstappen fests, while this year we have an opportunity to have another year where the best car doesn't win a championship. It's only happened on 8 occasions out of 75, where the most advanced machinery on the grid doesn't take all the glory, but it does prove that the ratio of importance from driver to car isn't just concrete in one direction. Personally, I believe it's 70% about the car and 30% about the driver, but what do you guys think? And we can also apply knowledge from previous years to give insight into 2024 too. The examples of 1994 and 95 point to the idea that Verstappen can win despite being in the worst car, and it can also follow a similar trajectory to 2009. It just depends on two things, whether Oscar Piastri agrees to become a number two driver to a prime bottler, or whether Red Bull pulled their finger out and stopped prioritising the guy who isn't fighting for a championship. Do they not realise that yes, you do want your second driver to get points, but you get more points for winning and getting 8th place than you do for getting 5th and 6th place? Anyways, with that being said, I think that brings today's video to a close. I hope you enjoyed me detailing whether the best car always wins in F1, and if you did, please remember to like, comment and subscribe to see more content from me in the future. You can also subscribe to my Patreon if you'd like to see exclusive content, get videos a day early and have an opportunity to converse with me personally for as little as $1 per month. Big shout out to my already existing Patreon subscribers Andy Lamberts, Eamon Dowdy, and George Stratford and you can also follow my X slash Twitter account where I post boiling hot lava takes on F1, IndyCar and NASCAR and follow my Instagram for behind the scenes updates. With my shameless plugging over though, I'm Nedzo and I'll see you all later. Bye!